Hello and welcome to our next Principal Chairs live stream. It's lovely to have you with us here today, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Stefan is the Principal Flute of the Chicago Symphony, previous Principal of the Met, originally from Iceland and now an international soloist and orchestral player. Stefan is also a professor at the Chicago Depot University. Thank you very much for being with us today, Stefan. It's brilliant to have you. Thank you for having me. It's brilliant. It's nice to be here. We've had lots of questions sent in already for Stefan to answer. So thank you to everybody who's contributed. Um, I'm, I hope we'll be able to get through all of them today. So that should be brilliant. And if anyone watching does have any more um, questions for Stefan, then they can comment below the Facebook video and we'll be able to see those questions and hopefully we can fit some of those in too. So let's get stuck straight in with Katrina's question. Uh, she asks, or she says, I would love to hear about your warm up routine. Do you have any unusual or usual exercises that you find particularly helpful? Yes. Um, well, it's pretty simple at the moment. I am, uh, I've been just kind of going back to basics in my, in my warm up routine. Um, <clears throat> now that I have more time to warm up in the morning than I ever have had <laughs> in the past. Um, I use the daily exercises by Moise uh, quite um, religiously every morning. And, and those are the ones with the letters, the A, B, and C, and D. Um, it's fairly simple. I just try to focus on my posture and uh, focus on good tone and intonation and to play them <clears throat> vocally, play them like a, a vocalize vocalizing the scales rather than kind of trying to buzz through them at a lightning speed. Another thing I like to do is improvising. Um, and I do that quite regularly when I, when I first start just to, to kind of um, get into my sound, to, to hear myself and just to kind of get my kind of musical brain working. Um, so yeah, I'm a fan of improvising. I, I love improvising. Mm -hmm. So these, yeah, these two things, I'd say. Yeah. And is that, um, how long do you think you usually spend warming up every day? And has that changed in the pandemic compared to when you're working as well, when you're working all the time in the orchestra usually? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I have less time to warm up, I, I choose actually just like sequences i like to use sequences uh scale uh, sequences going you know um or even um just just like moise de la sonrita you know um the first exercise um now i have had more time to uh, since the pandemic started obviously and i spent more time with just basics like scale posture good posture fingers um and uh, try to connect with the sound from a uh, vocal standpoint you know mm -hmm. to think that i am actually singing through the instrument when i when i play so mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what i'm what i've been up to mm -hmm. fantastic and we have another question from katrina actually she says your musical ideas are so insightful can you comment or give insight into your interpretation of pieces and the process you go through yeah i mean i i try to understand <clears throat> the music from the com uh, perspective of, of the composer um and from the style and the historical period that it was written in mm -hmm. That's that's what I try to um, understand, and um, I try to approach it uh, f from from the sort of, as I said, perspective of of the composer, and to um, get into the composer's language, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know every if, everyone has their own language when they when they compose. You know, and I feel it when I have imp improvised that, you know, the more I improvise, the kind of more I feel like I have my own style, maybe, you know, I have my own things that I like to do. And composers are the same way. They like, they have idiosync idiosyncratic ways. Like you could say, you know, Mozart and Bach and uh, anyone, Prokofiev, idiosyncratic 
ways that they express themselves in. So I like to get in touch with that when I when I learn a piece or when I study a piece. Another aspect that I have sort of try have I actually come to realize uh, recently. I was reading the Quant's um, book, mm -hmm. you know, how to play the flute, <laughs> um, and it's an uh, one sentence just popped right out at me, which is, you know, if it comes from the heart, it will reach the heart. Mm. So that's another thing I try to uh, do when I perform is to, to stay true and authentic to the music, but also come from a, uh, a space um, of the heart, mm -hmm. connection, heart connection with the music. Mm and um, to uh, play from, from that uh, uh, perspective. And can I ask, um, when you're sort of developing your understanding of the language of each individual composer, like Bach or Mozart, like you suggested, do you think you've come to that understanding of the, their language through years of playing their pieces or also through listening to their pieces? And is there a way that you think you potentially sort of young players or students can try and get more into the world of these individuals? Yeah, I think that, you know, I now have a lot of experience of playing these composers and uh, experience is really what it's all about. And the more experience you have in playing the music, the more you understand it. Mm -hmm. Students, you know, they are gaining experience. So my advice is try to really study the music in depth from, let's say you're working on a Mozart concerto, just to try to understand it from a compositional standpoint, you know, understand the way it's written, understand the harmony, understand what the other instruments are doing, you know, and at the same time, listen to, you know, other pieces. Like, so for say, for example, the, you know, the concertos were written at the same time as most of the operas. Although the concertos date, he hadn't written his major operas when he wrote the flute concertos. It's in interesting. Um, but as a student, just try to listen as much as you can, and also um, listen to yourself. You know, listen to what you are doing you see mm -hmm. so it's a very it's a it's a both an intellectual process and also a, a kind of an inward process to learn music mm -hmm. you learn it from a perspective of style and the, the, the style of the music the period of time and but also from a perspective of what you are saying what you are saying with the music so um that th these two fold things work together mm -hmm. to create a comprehensive you know the yeah. performance yeah. yeah fantastic um a question now from maria she asks with so many flute companies out there how did you decide on your equipment do you change for chamber settings and orchestral performance do you change your head joints frequently or do you stay the same I've stayed exactly the same flute and head joint for mm, 13, 14 years now. And mm. I have not changed at all. I have tried different head joints out of curiosity, but I always come back to my own <laughs> setup. So that's, that's just my, my thing. I used, to, I used to fool around a lot with, with um, you know, when I was in my early days at the Met, I, I played many different flutes there and I but now I've kind of after the older I got the more I just try to stick to one thing mm -hmm. and and it gives me a certain satisfaction uh, like the the Emmanuel flute I play um, a flute made by Manuel Arista who lives in Boston mm -hmm. who is a brilliant flute maker and uh, a great craftsman um, and I, I just love the sound of his flutes. Um, with other flute makers, there's, there's a lot out there. You know, I mean, you know, um, I just prefer the sound of this one. So that's <laughs> basically it. <laughs> so which were the flutes that you swapped between when you were in the Met? 
Um, well, I started off on altos. Mm -hmm. That was my flute for, for many years. And I, I, I like their instruments very much. And um, yeah, those, those were the, those, that was my, my flute of choice before I found the Emmanuel. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I think that the flutes make up about 5% of what we do. Mm -hmm. The the other ninety five percent is just hard work, mm -hmm. hard work, of the students or of of our behalf. Mm -hmm. So far, the, the flute itself, you know, the main thing is that it's reliable mechanically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that it's made well. You know, the the keys, the mechanism, all the moving parts are made really well. That's the main thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you, could you describe the difference in sound between playing on the Altus versus the Arista? You know, I, I can't really, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, I have a certain, you know, this, my sound is, is very much just in my head. And, you know, if I played an Altus flute or an Arista flute for you right now, you maybe wouldn't be able to tell. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain way, what I'm looking for, a certain nuance, it's, it's really in my head. You know, my sound is really in my head and it's in our heads always. It starts in here and then it comes out here. Yeah. So I can't really describe the, the differences in sound. I mean, I just came to a point where I, where I wanted something else and I was looking for I don't know. It was mostly for my hands. Okay. It was mostly here in my in the key work and the reliability and feel mm -hmm. of the instrument that kind of made my uh, choice. But the sound is, you know, you can always manipulate the sound. You can yeah. always find different ways. Mm -hmm. you know, play. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you for that question, Maria. Mm -hmm. Um, John says, I loved your first album. Can we expect any future recordings from you? Um, I have nothing planned, mm -hmm. but I want to make another recording. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, I have, once we're out of the, this isolation period, I, I hope to start to, mm -hmm. you know, want to do something else. I mean, to do a recording somewhere. I don't know. I don't know when or where. Yeah. Have you any ideas for, uh, are there any pieces that you'd really love to record? Yeah. I mean, I want to play the Bach sonatas. Mm -hmm. I really want to record them. And uh, I've just, I, I love Bach and I, I love, um, you know, to get deeper into his music and uh, understand his music and uh, so yeah I would like to I would like to do that next mm -hmm. so we'll see I'll mm -hmm. let you know yeah. and do, do you ever play um, on a baroque flute or any period instruments or do you always stick to the modern instrument when playing bar I've, I've never played a baroque flute no I've never mm -hmm. tried I, <laughs> I have great admiration for mm -hmm. for the sound and, and people that do play them mm -hmm. um, no I've never done that I used to play a Louis lot Flute mm -hmm. when I was um, younger, I have, um, and that was, it was a flute made in 1886. And uh, it was a beautiful silver flute. Um, it was not tuned or anything. It had the original lip plate and everything. And it had a tremendous effect on me. I think that it, that sound, particularly in its unadulterated, state mm -hmm. really kind of opened my ears to you know the way silver flutes were, did sound and the way people used to play mm -hmm. and um i couldn't use the flute in the, in the orchestra unfortunately i i didn't but i um but that sound left an impression on me that i i will never mm. you know forget mm. brilliant Another, now another question from Millie. Uh, she says, coming from a small fishing village in Iceland, how did it come about that you ended up in the UK and then America? Yeah, that, that was, um, 
an interesting journey. I mean, I started off playing the flute when I was nine in a small village and um, met my teacher when I was nine. Um, he lived in Reykjavik. He was a, um, his name is Bernhard Wilkinson. He was originally from Manchester in UK mm -hmm. and um, lived in Iceland for many, many years and, uh, and uh, was a principal flute in the Iceland Symphony. And I st started studying with him when I was nine. And I used to take lessons uh, with him every month. And I drove, my father drove me to Reykjavik from that small village mm -hmm. every month for, for many years, for a few years. And, um, and so the time came when I graduated, when I was 20, um, from the Reykjavik School of Music, I, I graduated from there and um, wanted to get my master's degree and uh, decided to study with Peter Lloyd in Manchester mm -hmm. and um, so that's how I ended up there mm -hmm. and um, it was a wonderful experience I loved Peter uh, it was a great time mm -hmm. and um, so and America came after that uh, there were personal circumstances that led me to New York City um, in my early 20s and I um, sort of was looking for for work really and i was looking for auditions and stuff like that and mm -hmm. um things gradually sort of started happening for me in new york city i got into the freelance scene there and um met many people who encouraged me to you know stay there mm -hmm. and uh there were auditions coming up at new york city opera and ballet when i came over there and um, right a year after that, the Met Opera um, had a second flute opening. So I took the New York City Ballet and Opera auditions. And then right after that, I took the uh, Met Opera audition and was first uh, second flute in piccolo at the Met 2004. Uh -huh. My first job. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Actually, I have another question. What drew you to um, continue your studies in Manchester? Um, well, I, I had met Peter Lloyd when I was a teenager in some, some uh, summer schools mm -hmm. in England. And uh, he was just such an, a wonderful teacher and, and a wonderful man. And, and he, we kind of kept in touch after I after I met him and, and he encouraged me to come study with him. So I, it was kind of a natural progression um, that I went to him. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, I was very, um, I, I loved his, his, his way of teaching and I learned, learned so much from him as well as my, my first teacher, Bernhard, who was my, my biggest musical influences and uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. I think I heard in another of your online interviews about that it was quite a commitment for you driving across Iceland for these flute lessons. Is that right? It was quite far. Mm, yes, it's about nine hours from the village I grew up in and to, to Reykjavik. My father was, was very committed to my mm. getting this education because there, there was no real uh, school where I grew up, uh, no real good teachers. So I, um, um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing time, you know, um, that my parents really sacrificed so much for my education and uh, to, to do this for me. I uh, left a big impression on me also. Mm, fantastic. Another question from Millie, which is along the same lines, actually. Did you notice a change in the style of playing when you're moving from Iceland to the UK to America? And did you have to adapt your playing at all for that? No, that that one. There's just one answer to that. I, <laughs> I, I I I never was able to detect any differences in style, and still don't. Mm -hmm. I just still don't. It's something that, you know, music is music, and you know, if people play music musically, and then it's. I, I never could un understand the differences in style. Maybe there was a time in history when there was a bigger, bigger difference. Like 
early 20th century when you know german players played wooden flutes and the british players played wooden flutes and french players played silver mm -hmm. and then americans adopted the silver flute and then there was more of a sort of a separate difference now everyone plays the same flute and is trying to get the same kind of sound so i never really understood the, the any difference mm. 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 um and would you say that your that opinion is also can sort of consolidated by presumably you sit on some um audition panels for the food yeah exactly you know when you sit on an audition panel i um I, I can't tell where, where, where the person is from it just what the person is doing and saying if they're playing that that you know perks off my ears yeah brilliant just a reminder to everybody who's watching if you do have any questions then please comment below the facebook video um because we should have some time for some extra questions if anyone has any and then um you'll be able to get your questions answered live um but in the meantime we have another question um, from Millie, she says, can you tell us a bit about your current recording projects that have been current, getting during lockdown? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not recording anything on my own. I'm recording mm -hmm. with the Chicago Symphony mm -hmm. and we have been recording in Orchestra Hall here in, in Chicago. We started doing that in September and uh, there was an online platform called CSO TV that is now available through the Chicago Symphony website. And we record material uh, for that, for that, um, for the website. And I have been recording, uh, first I recorded the um, uh, kind of a quintet recital. Uh, we got together all princ five principles of the uh, wind section and we formed a quintet and we recorded the Nielsen, and uh, quintet and uh, piazzola pieces and then some other things and then i have been recording the mozart flute quartet and right now i'm working on the brandenburg concertos by bach uh, we are recording the second one and next week we record the uh, number five mm -hmm. so that's uh it's been great and uh, a wonderful thing that the chicago symphony has kept us kept the music going through this platform and uh, very grateful for that. So um, can viewers watch those um, on the CSO website that you were mentioning? Is that um, sort of online ticket sales or is it just a yeah. bit? Yeah, you buy, uh, you pay per view basically it's called here that you, you buy um, a session. I think it's 10 or $15 and you, you can watch, watch your concert. It's, it's really brilliant. I think it's, a great thing now nowadays and when can we expect the brandenburg concertos to come out do you know when they might be released i think now they will be just around christmas like a couple of weeks okay. um uh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah it uh, went very well um and uh it's been great to, to record and they, they do a great job of the cinematography and the, and the audio is very good mm -hmm. so yeah we, we'll keep our eyes peeled for those then mm. <laughs> Um, a question from Beth. She says, when you, um, oh, what were your auditions like for the Met and in Chicago and how did they differ? Well, the one big difference, there was no screen in the Chicago audition uh -huh. <laughs> and there was a screen in uh, Chicago. I mean, so there was a screen audition at the Met yeah. all the way, all the way till the bitter end. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh -huh. uh, um, I took two auditions at the Met. I my first one when I was second flute, when I was new to the orchestra. And then I auditioned again within the orchestra when the principal chair opened up mm -hmm. um, in 2008. And I had to go behind the screen again. <laughs> so that was um, um, quite an amazing experience. Um, then Chicago was completely open um and it was a different feeling playing for people you know ver versus playing for just the, the 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 screen i there's a certain greatness in having this 
screened round all the way. And I, I like that very much. It's uh, the, the math. There's, um, you know, the panel, the, the, the people, um, the, the players in the orchestra vote for who they think is fit. And these votes are counted. And then that person in the very final, all the votes are counted. And then that person gets a job. There's no discussion. Mm -hmm. it's just votes mm -hmm. so you know you don't have people saying oh i didn't like that and you know no 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 and then <laughs> blah 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 and then so that's a certain advantage because when i first came when i first took the audition in 2004 i i didn't really you know have much experience in orchestral playing i've i i was you know very good obviously <laughs> i mean i did very well i um but i i hadn't really i had no real credentials so to speak you know so it was an amazing uh thing and i my first you know job was a piccolo and second flute mm -hmm. so it opens up doors you know really for people that that um you know you can't see them you don't know who they are and then basically they're forced to choose a winner in the finals you see what i mean um, so that's a certain advantage. Um, and, uh, but however, the other symphony orchestras do different things. They invite, you know, people to their final rounds and they have screening rounds and they have just a different system. Mm. And I can't say, you know, what's wrong, what's right. It's whatever works for each organization. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, were there lots of rounds for both of the auditions with the different orchestras? Do you remember, did they go on for days? Because I've heard about some that have had so many rounds over three or four days. Were they that extensive? The Met audition had the most rounds. You know, I had took about a week. Um, I played my pre preliminary round on a Monday, I think, then I played the the semi-final on a Wednesday, and I think uh, finals were on a Friday or something like that. So it was it was a lot of people, so a lot of applicants, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting that you're talking about going from a second flute and piccolo chair to a principal chair. Do you feel that you um, adapted your playing for that, or do you feel they were actually in more similar roles? No, I I, I adapted. Of course, for that uh, second flute, piccolo is a different, a different job. You know, when you're when you're in a section, you are supporting the principal and supporting the other people around you, obviously in your section. Mm -hmm. So you're it's more about kind of blending and being flexible, extremely flexible, and um, you know, not overpowering and not under playing mm -hmm. either. So you know, it's about that fitting into that role. The principle is more of a, you know, the authority of the section, you know, gets to play the solos and is, is the voice of that particular section. Mm -hmm. So when I stepped up, I very much felt I had to kind of amp up that game of, you know, being solos, being, knowing what I'm doing, knowing what I'm going to do being very clear about, you know, uh, my role. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a different role, absolutely. Fantastic. We've actually had a couple of live questions now. We've got one here from Ashley, and she says, um, your parents were clearly so instrumental in your achievements with their support. Would you encourage your children to pursue a career in music, aside from them playing your recorder from when you were a child? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I have two wonderful children. I have a four-year-old son and a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. I would definitely encourage them to, uh, to play music. I will certainly not force them to play music. Um, but I, I very much, they are very much, uh, they want to play instruments. So, yes, absolutely, I will support them in that and uh, give them the support that I was given mm -hmm. as a child. And it's very important to 
to to nurture children's musical um, education because it helps everything else in their development. Mm. Hopefully, you wouldn't have to drive quite so far now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, as as well as sort of their obviously helping their general development, do you think the classical music career is a career that you they that you'd um, encourage them to go into but maybe that's not really an encouragement that's just whether they decide so yeah I think if they want to do it it's great you know but they have to learn uh, that you're going to have to work extremely hard and uh, that's uh, it's very 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 hard work Mm -hmm. and being an artist of any kind dancer or you know visual artist or anything Mm -hmm. it's just that's a lot of hard work and um, dedication Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, the, I I would definitely not discouraging from from that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a, it's a mm-hmm. calling for some people. For some people, it's something else. It's you know, people's lives are so different. You know. Yeah. Do they? Did you say they already play some instruments, or are they a bit young yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they haven't really. My my son has a violin. He likes very much. Mm-hmm. And uh, my daughter is one. She's uh, just, uh, she likes the piano, actually. She sat down the other day and like, was like picking up notes. I was very impressed. <laughs> she was very, had a very proper posture. And, yeah. Really? Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think that, um, at the, especially at the younger ages, um, do you think that young children can motivate themselves to practice? Or do you think that often it at that young age, it is the, um, there's need for the parents to kind of guide them in that sense. It, it varies. I hadn't, I, no one ever had to tell me to practice. I just played day in and day out. Mm. And, uh, but some great players I've known have had <laughs> parents that had to force them to practice. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's just different for everyone. Yeah. And uh, sometimes parents have to, you know, struggle and keep them at it <laughs> until they, click and then they just wow I'm going to practice all day long (laughs) you never know (laughs) brilliant um another question from Beth that we had sent in in advance uh she asks what advice can you offer to young players during these challenging times well I think first of all um it's you know daunting to to watch the, the world of the arts you know in this current state, um, it's it's daunting, and I, I understand if people get discouraged. And I, however, recommend people stick to what your heart tells you. You know, if you want to pursue a career in music, you know, stick to it. You know, keep doing it. Get better at it. You know, now that we have more time than we otherwise would have had, we have no. We don't have so much distractions. So use the time to become a better player and uh, to become the player that you dream to become, you know. Mm. And I think it is to keep that, you know, connection alive. And, you know, it's difficult. It's very difficult, but it's worth it in the long run, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Have you been continuing to teach your students at the Chicago Depot University through the pandemic, or has that moved online? Or they? Yeah, I have been only online at DePaul uh, University. Um, I have three students there, and we have been meeting, you know, every week on on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I've given master classes also studio classes via Zoom and it's been fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not ideal, of course, to teach people like that, but we've managed to get some very good work done and it's been it's been good. Brilliant. Um, we did have another question from Beth. Wait, I wish I just need to, if I can find it. Oh, what was it like moving from the Met to the Chicago Symphony? Um, well, it was like uh, it, it was it was uh, it was a lot of difference. I mean, you know the, what the Met Orchestra does. You know, is just playing opera. You know, ninety percent of the time, 
So you're in the pit. You're in pretty much dark surroundings, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I just found that when I moved to um, Chicago, that just the spotlight's on me, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm the singer, you know. There's no one, there's no one above me, you know, dressed in a fancy gown, you know, being a soloist. I'm, you know, one of the, you know, contributing contributing factors. So in terms of musical contribution, there's more coming from me in in a in a symphonic orchestra setting versus opera orchestra. Although, you know, in a an opera orchestra you contribute a lot, obviously. Of course, I'm not saying. But it's different. You are um part of an accompaniment in mm -hmm. a way that is supporting the soloist, this the opera, the dramatic flow of the opera. Mm -hmm. So that was the the biggest difference, I'd say, you know, and all these lights obviously, you know, you're on a stage where you're spotlights on you I still you know in the pit I remember I was one year when I after the the year after I won the Chicago Symphony chair I still had a whole year to play at the Met because I couldn't start I couldn't leave right away so I remember I had to do it back and forth I had to do some concerts here in Chicago and go back and play opera as well so it was a big year of changing so I just remember going into the pit was like so dark you know <laughs> so dark in here <laughs> and then going on the stage and like the lights you know oh i'm in the spotlight okay you know mm. so and um you know uh, opera orchestra versus symphonies is, is a it's a fascinating uh world you know i hope i hope to write a book about it one day yeah and but um do you think that do you feel you've got the best of both worlds having experienced the repertoire in both orchestras or is there a do you prefer symphonic versus opera, or there's a particular type of repertoire you prefer? I, I am extremely grateful that I got the opportunity to play opera and to learn operas, and uh, because that that repertoire has is so rich, because you uh, have so many things, and there's so many things. There's there's drama there's uh, the story there's the um, amazing singing there's this, and there is uh you know the language the different languages there's italian german french and all these different styles mm -hmm. and you learn so much about that when you when you play this kind of music handle operas you know it was an amazing um education and also just witness singers, witness how they work and express themselves. And I love the symphonic repertoire. I mean, I'm extremely grateful now that I get to play symph symphonies and this, all the stuff that I never got to play at the Met, like, you know, the big, the big stuff. And uh, I love, I love both worlds. And I'm just very fortunate that I, I have had the opportunity to, to do both. I have a question actually um, that sort of goes back to earlier when you were speaking about getting to know the character or the style of each individual composer. I was wondering whether having um, presumably played some Mozart operas um, at the Met, did that change your um, understanding of the character of Mozart in his other music as well? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's, the, this thing, uh, his music is is intertwined, the opera and concerto and instrumental and opera writing. When he was writing for the instruments, he was writing the operas at the same time, so that's all connected. You hear, you know, um, characters in the concertos, for example. You can almost hear the character of the soprano. You can hear the character of the, the bass and the character of the tenor. You can almost hear all these different, you know, characters in the music because, you know, it's there. It's it's all one thing, you know, it's an organic thing. So, yeah, and it's a great, it's a great question. And uh, I very often think about that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because like, for example, the D major concerto, I mean, the last movement is directly out of the uh, um, abduction of the seraglio. Um, there's an aria 
So it's the same thing. So I got, I had the great pleasure of playing the Seraglio and I, and I also had the great pleasure two years ago to play the D major concerto here in, in Chicago. And it's just, it just all came together in such a beautiful way. And do you think you ever sort of think, oh, that motif, that reminds me of Papageno, for instance, mm -hmm. like that. And do you assign those in your pieces when you're preparing a concerto, or is it more fluid than that? It, it's more, I don't have to just really think of it. It comes kind of just uh, as an inspiration, really, for me. And, and I hear, I, I can hear the, the opera arias when I play it, and I, it, it comes naturally. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, thank you. That's a very helpful answer. Mm. We have a question from Lottie. She says, if you could go back and give advice to yourself as a young student, what would you say? Yeah, I, I thought about this question and I I don't really know. I, well, I have an idea, but I think a lot of what we do is we're meant to learn a certain thing at a certain time <laughs> for a certain reason. The only thing I would say is I would probably ask myself to be more mindful of good posture <laughs> and and proper finger movement and because uh, these are the things that I have had to work quite hard on in uh, my, my throughout my life and I good posture and good breathing I would go tell myself that <laughs> <laughs> yes um, another question actually that I think you possibly have answered this a little already but if you have anything else to say on it um, how did you start out on the flute and what were your early lessons like? Um, well, actually, I started at the age of eight. And um, I, I, had, uh, I was playing recorder when I was six. Um, I was very good at the recorder. My father picked up on that and kind of started handing different instruments to me, uh, the trumpet, <laughs> the clarinet, and I, I didn't like any of it. And then I... I have a relative in the small town where I grew up, and, and she is a flute player, wonderful uh, flute player. And I, I had my first lesson with her. And mm -hmm. my father said, Well, why don't you have a lesson with her? You know, see what you think of the flute. So it was just uh, an immediate connection. Mm -hmm. and, and she had a great advice for me for the first time I picked it up. She said, Don't play the, the entire thing, just play the head joint for one week. Mm -hmm. She told me. Just play the head joint, try to find the sound. It's really carefully. And I, I did that and I went home and I was playing the head joint for a week and I and then I couldn't wait to put it the whole thing together. So the next week after that I put the thing together and that's how it was like, wow, you know, this is yeah. it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. And then was it quite soon after that that you then moved um onto the other teacher that was further away yeah. or did you stay? Yeah, I, I could not uh, study formally with, you know, this relative of mine. Um, so I, my father, uh, we had to look for a different teacher. So um, my mm -hmm. father had connections in the city, in Reykjavik, where, mm -hmm. where I got to meet my, meet Bernhard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Lucy. She says, now that you've had the chance to be on the other side of the screen, what positive attributes most stand out for you from the musicians that you hear? Um, I would say the understanding of style and, uh, is the first one, the understanding of musical style, uh, the genuine sort of um, understanding of the music that you're playing um, and um, knowing where it, how it fits in and where it fits in and other moving components within this section that you're playing that you are respecting. So it's really about understanding the music and you can hear it and you can hear people that, that have spent time on that, you know, because um, style is, you have to incorporate so many things into it, you know, it's, it's sound, you know, tone, what kind of color of sound do you want to play with? You know, what does it require? And it's the how well people distinguish between you know 
all these different excerpts that are required um, that that really makes a big big difference for me and the control that, that people have over that mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. fantastic um, our next question is from Paul uh, he says who has been your biggest musical inspiration and why I have thought about this question and I I have so many different musical um, inspirations from so many different players and, and teachers and people that I, I can't really name one. <laughs> I, you know, Bernard, my first teacher was a, a huge uh, influence on me, the biggest one probably because I was this formative age where I was drinking in the knowledge of sound and the knowledge of, 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 of the music and, and he also taught me very much about um, you know the inner workings of, of music composition harmony and and other things as well as that um, then after that I'd say in terms of musical effect on me was probably when I was a very young kid and um, my my father and I used to play every week for people at the elderly home mm -hmm. in a town where I grew up. And um, in another town close by, there was a home for the disabled also. And we used to go, rotate, go to these places and play for people, mm -hmm. the patients. And um, that, more than anything, had an effect on me that I... I still think about every day um, to understand why we play music and why people want to hear it and what effect it has on people mm. because people in those in those places where I went to play as a young child with my father I would see the effect that on the music had on them I would start to play my father accompanied me either on the organ or accordion or piano. Sometimes there was a piano in the, one of the play, places we used to do. And we used to play. I have, still have the book we played from. It is, it's called Flute Solos, this book. It has um, all different kinds of music in it. It's, uh, it's very fun. I still, <laughs> still look at it. But the effect that the music had on people, you know, they would sometimes cry they would sometimes they would smile or they would be so elevated by it and for a young child it was very powerful mm -hmm. and that more than anything i think um informs my 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 sort of musical journey mm -hmm. so you know it's about the music and uh, how to we bring it to people. Mm. That's brilliant that you had that experience at such a young age and sort of realized how much of an effect your playing could have on people. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. And yeah. uh, sort of the question, why we're doing it and mm. why we need it, why, what is it for? You know what I mean? And I, I like to talk to people, um, talk to students about that because you know it can get wrapped up in so much just bureaucracy about music this can be so sterile and dry mm -hmm. you know um, uh, we have to get away from that find the essence of it mm. of why why we're doing what we're doing you know maybe. yeah we just had another live question actually which is sort of along similar lines. Ashley asks, what should you do when you understand the essence and meaning behind the music, but you can't yet convey it as a performer? Is it time, musical study or reading? What should one do when you understand? Uh-huh, yes. Well, you know, learn a piece from memory, I would say. Try to memorize music as much as you can um i find that to be a very good tool important tool and i did a lot of that in in my sort of college years and after right after college i tried to memorize 
music because that it's it's great it's good to use the music fine of course but once you memorize it 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 takes seat in a different place in your being mm -hmm. and you start to really listen and you start to kind of analyze more closely with your ears what's going on rather than you know just the visually looking at something and doing something is is um sometimes can be a distraction and can't get in the way of what you want to understand so it's just a lot of hard work i'm i'm sorry to tell you but it's like that to understand music great music is takes time and experience and the more you play the more you perform the better you get at it the more you understand it and I, I, that's my been my experience. Now I play, you know, for example, the Bach Partita in A minor. I, I was petrified of this piece for so many years. I didn't know how to play it, but now I've been playing it more and more every year, and I feel like I understand it more and more every year. You mm -hmm. see, so it just a being patient, being patient with the process, learning the piece, leaving it a little bit, and. And then coming back to it. But memorization is a very important part of it also. It's very important mm -hmm. to, um, to learn how to convey the music. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, do you have any um, processes that you, you used to use or do you use for memorization? Um, it's sort of a structural breakdown or do you, is it mostly from repetition and understanding? Um, my kind of, um process of memorization it's interesting with the flute because we can't see our fingers and see anything when pianists and violinists have this advantage they can see what they're doing or even you know on clan i guess or oboist but we have just this you know we're looking at <laughs> you know so i like to just kind of experiment a little bit with it i sometimes just use photographic memory just completely visualize the page at other times it's more just patterns of the fingers um and just the kind of um feeling in your hands almost mm -hmm. tactile you know what the what your fingers are doing at, at a certain point and it's a complicated thing I can't really explain mm -hmm. it memorization is a fascinating you know subject but I think uh, learning in smaller uh, bits is better you know so I don't try to you know memorize an entire thing I try to focus on smaller sections mm -hmm. and practice those sections and then go move on from that and then practice the next section and then yeah. combine them then you know there's, there's a lot of things you can do and um, you know actors go through this a lot and, and they have uh, different techniques to do it there's a uh, there's a lot of repetition obviously involved a lot of repetition mm -hmm. mm. and actually going back to ashley's question um about understanding the music she mentioned um about reading whether that's part of it and you mentioned earlier about your reading of um quants on playing the flute is that something you also recommend, um, particularly with sort of earlier music to read, or, or not even necessarily early music, but to read around the composer or the, t the time period and things? Is that part of your interpretation, do you think? Absolutely. Um, reading, you know, words from, you know, the composers or, or reading about music from that particular time period. I, I found quants very, very um, fascinating because, you know, I think that one of the biggest dilemmas about, you know, early music is that we don't have any recordings. And unfortunately, the composers didn't bother writing anything in the music either. So we're left with just, yeah, you know, nothing really. So we <laughs> have to figure out from reading books about, and you know, a lot of the early music stuff is like there was what I understand from from Quantz is that you know it's it's musical taste you know and style that he is after you know you read you know that's something that has to be brought to the table 
the musical taste, awareness of style, musical instincts. You know, like playing Bach, you have to use, you know, you have to go to the very core of your being of musical instincts to learn, to understand the music and play from that. Not just from some, you know, scholar that says, no, you can't do this, you have to do that. And there's this do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. I recommend more going, using the musical instincts in, in, that, in that respect. Um, there's great books on, on all sorts of, um, you know, composers and I have books on Ravel and, and Debussy and I love to read about them. This book on Beethoven that I have, Beethoven's Letters, you know, his writing is, is it's amazing to read what he was going through. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he was writing his music and in his compromised state, or in Mozart's letters for that matter, you mm -hmm. know, read those, this hilarious. It's the most amazing uh, stuff that, 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 you, that, you, that you, can, you can find and understand the music from that standpoint, you know what I mean? Brilliant, thank you for that question, Ashley. I think we've got time for one last question. Yeah. We had one sent in from Arthur and he asks, are there any concertos that you haven't yet had the opportunity to perform that you'd like to play in the future? Yeah, it's like, you know, I've played most of them and I, I um, uh, one concerto that I, I heard when I was young, I heard actually in Iceland, um, is uh, Rautavara, Dances with the Wind. It's a, it's a beautiful concerto that I would like to play at some point. Mm -hmm. I've always, I'm always, I love that piece. Another concerto is Reineke. I've never played the Reineke concerto. I Mm -hmm. Hope I'll do that someday, but I'm always um, curious to see what is being written now. Um, and there's a composer I just discovered, uh, Nicolas Bacri, it's a French composer, um, has written. He wrote a bass clarinet concerto that I played last season, and I absolutely loved the music. And I, I got to know him, and and he's, he writes the most wonderful music. And he has written a sonata for flute. And he's just about to send me the PDF of it. I'm very excited mm -hmm. to to play it. Fantastic. It sounds like you've played such a variety of repertoire over your career that there are, it's good to hear there are still new pieces for you that are still left to, <laughs> to have the chance to play. So hopefully you'll get the chance to play those at some point. Yes, I hope so. There's much, there's so much music in the world that I'd like to play. I mean, there's just endless amount. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stefan. For thank you, Camilla. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who sent in questions. We've had a really fantastic mix of questions. Um, and I feel we've got it quite in depth into almost music philosophy in some ways. So it's been brilliant to talk to you. Um, thank you, everybody who's watching. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much.